All right, let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, this morning. What a privilege to be in your house. Lord, what an honor to have been given the word of God. You have been, you've given us so much. And Lord, to be able to break the bread, to be able to get into it and have the Holy Spirit open this up for us. Lord, it is just a beautiful, beautiful thing. We give you praise, Lord. I need your help this morning to deliver even a part of what's running through my mind, my heart. Lord, I thank you. Show us today what you need us to see and what you need us to understand. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are still in Colossians. Uh, I know that was a shocker. Oh. Still? Oh my gosh. <laughs> today we're going to be talking about no longer running on empty. And <laughs> this ought to be interesting. Okay. Last week, what we went over was that Paul was concerned for the churches in the passage that we were talking. His concern for the churches was, was pretty solid because he is aware of the heresies that were coming their direction and that they were having to deal with. He told them to be careful full, 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 philosophy and intellect. And if there is ever a time that we need to really hear that word, it's right now. The, the interesting thing about philosophy and intellect it is massive. It's a big deal right now. and We need to understand what he was saying. But he also had a, quite a bit to talk about about spiritual authority, that he had spiritual authority over them, even though he had never met them face to face. He had spiritual authority. That's impressive. Now, in case you hadn't noticed, spiritual authority has come up almost every week somehow. I just want to let you know this kind of recurring theme, okay? Yeah. But we also understand from last week's passage that the Holy Spirit blabs everything to the authorities, okay? <laughs> there's no... If authority is going to listen, he's going to hear it all because there's no reason... I mean, God's going to definitely blab it. That's a big deal. But then we got this big nugget. As you received Christ Jesus as Lord, walk in him. How did we receive him? Desperately. We had great need. We had to, by faith, humble ourselves and come to an understanding. Okay, anybody that is trying to come to Jesus and wants to keep control of their lives and keep all, the, you're missing the point. Okay? Coming to Jesus is a complete dying to self. And so the whole idea behind dying to self is huge in the walk we have with him. And we are to be walking this thing out. How? By dying to self. You know, nobody likes that theme. I don't know anybody who says, oh, I'm hoping they're going to talk about humility today. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well... I've, I've, I don't know how many, if you're going to have a men's retreat, women's retreat, couples retreat, I don't care what it is, if you advertise in advance that the subject matter is going to be humility, nobody's coming. They're not going to spend a lot of money to go to your retreat to sit there and listen about humility, even though they should. Okay? It's almost as bad as having a men's retreat where you're going to talk about prayer and fasting at a men's retreat. Right, they're coming, right? No, my mommy's calling my name. Okay, but as you, as you receive Christ, walk in him. It's not enough to just receive Jesus. You have to walk it out. There is a consistency. There's a, a calling of God for us to walk it every moment, every minute of the day. If you make it into a religion, you don't have to. You've done your thing, and that's the way it is. But in a relationship, it is something that has to be built and worked on and touched and continually there. A relationship with Jesus is what makes it work. You, you received him to gain the relationship. Now walk the relationship. What a, what a concept. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. And they talked about how there's roots and good building. It says being rooted and established rooted and established or built upon the foundation, confirmed and acknowledged in the faith, and then 
it talked about, and as you were taught, continue in this, but do it with thanksgiving. As you were taught. There's a lot that we have been taught we need to continue in. Have you ever been convicted about something for the fourth time? Uh, fourth, maybe. Fourth? 900th? Okay. Yeah. Hey, you know, go ahead and just explain to somebody how that works. Their question is going to be, well, if it was God telling you not to do it, shouldn't you kind of like quit? It's kind of a big problem, folks, is that we're back at spiritual authority. Are you going to submit or not? You know, and I've, this is kind of a fascinating deal. Uh, you guys all know I deal with a lot, of, a lot of men who have those kind of defiling issues. I enjoy, I enjoy working with men and watching them get set free. That is exciting. That is very, very exciting. The hardest part is working with their wives. It's a big deal. Because they're not convicted. They say, well, I didn't do the sin, he did. Life gets interesting at that point. So let's look at the passage we just went over last week. Colossians 2, 4 through 7 says, And I say that no one, I say this, that no one may beguile you with persuasive words. Now, what is it? Remember what it is, this, this, that he said, I tell you this, and no one will beguile you? Christ in you, the hope of glory. I tell you these things, that the mystery of God is Christ in you. I tell you these things, that no one may beguile you with persuasive words, because it's not about intellect, it's about a relationship. For though I am indeed absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing and seeing your order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him, being rooted and being built up in him and being confirmed in the faith, even as you were taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And again, what a sentence. How much is there in this sentence? Good grief. Or, no, the grief would be good. It's okay. We'll just go on. Okay. <laughs> what we're going to do now, though, is God has been setting us up. If you haven't been noticing, he's been walking us step by step into a higher and a higher and a higher, getting this understanding the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory, getting it deeper into as you received him, walk in him, Christ in you, the hope of glory, that's what you received, walk that out. We're seeing this thing building and building and building. Click the seatbelts. <sighs> 10, 9. You can just feel this thing coming because here we go. Colossians 2 8 says, Watch that there not be one robbing you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the elements of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, this is, again, setting us up. This is the beginning of the sentence as we're heading into somewhere, okay? Watch these things. Watch that there not be one robbing you through philosophy and empty deceit. Now, the word robbing you, is, it's a good translation. That's a good word. It also is the same word for seducing you. It's taking something from you that is precious. Don't let somebody take from you something that is so precious. Now, you know, you steal something out of my garage. Okay. It's still a violation. It's still stealing. It's still something there. If it was all that precious, it wouldn't be sitting in my garage. But the issue is, what's really of value? Okay? You don't leave your wallet out in the garage. Not unless it's a real mistake. <laughs> you, know, you don't just leave your, your uh, credit cards, cash, sitting out. There's certain things that you do value more. Diamond jewelry, you know, things like that, which I have so much of. Okay, but there are certain things that I do have great value on that others would not even think about even stealing. It doesn't matter to them. Okay, there's certain things that matter to me. I have a certain couple books in my shelves that are extremely important to me. 
I mean, very. If they were gone, there would be a huge emptiness, a huge value gone. It's valuable to me. Okay, certain things. Why should there not be anyone stealing or seducing you through philosophy and empty deceit? Philosophy. Have you ever broken that word down? It's right out of the Greek. Okay? Philo, a fondness toward. Sophia, wisdom. Philosophy is a fondness towards wisdom. Now, that's what the word means. But then, again, psychology means the study of the suke, and they missed that one, so it's okay. <laughs> The fondness for, what is philosophy? It's a fondness for my set of wisdom. I'm searching out my set of what I am doing. It's a philosophy behind it. Uh, I had a, I took philosophy class in high school. It was fun. I was the only Christian in the class. Okay. The teacher was not a believer. And they wanted to get, uh, we read Plato and Socrates and we did all this amazing discussions and it wasn't a debate class. He made sure we understood that. This is not a debate class. This is a class on philosophy. So I had to get really sneaky. See, that's, they're the ones that taught me to be sneaky because I'm not sneaky normally and naturally. Okay, I'm just... Um, he said, to, I'm going to... I want you guys to really work on this and come up with something. He says, I need a definition of love. I want you to work. This is a philosophy class. I want you to have a definition of love. And I want it in here, and we're going to discuss what love is. That ought to be. I mean, this is a full philosophic discussion, right? Yeah, this is, yes, this is in the 60s, which is kind of funny. So <laughs> I went home, and I said, easiest paper I've ever had to write God is love. three words I put it down God is love and signed it that was my whole thing definition of love or what is love God is love Lietti. turned it in he was so mad he says what is this and I says that is a complete paper it has a subject, it has a verb, it has an end. <laughs> it is complete. <laughs> I said, you want to go talk to the English teacher? Because this is... This is all. And he was, you can't... You, I, I just like this. And I said, okay, so what you're trying to tell me is that you would approve a paper for me to write in this class describing God, right? Uh, I says, let me show you right here in the scripture where it says God is love, and it says it twice verified the most verifiable piece of and I'd even put the Bible as a bibliography reference okay the whole class was upset at this because they worked so hard on trying to describe what love is <laughs> and yet as they gave their definitions of love I sat there and said really so you're saying and it became this really bad debate which is not a debate class. <laughs> when I got done with the class, the coach who was, or the, the teacher who was the, um, the wrestling coach said, you coming out for wrestling? No. <laughs> no, sorry, not going to happen. He says, I want to get back at this so bad. Oh, well. Philosophy and empty deceit, by the way, empty deceit, and it means that, empty lies. They're empty. Of course, lies don't have any substance that's all good and it says according to the tradition of men tradition now if you look in Matthew or Mark chapter 7 when Jesus is talking about them he says you say oh anything that I would do for my parents is korban which means it's a gift unto the temple and so I don't have to do anything for my parents because I'm doing stuff for the temple and so they're going to have to just consider that and so he says so you're taking the traditions of men, and what he said in that passage, that is verse 13, I think it is, in Mark 7, it says, taking the traditions of men, you make the word of God of no effect. That thing has always plagued me. Because to take the traditions of men, you make the word of God of no effect. Ah, oh, that just... And growing up in a very legalistic church, you can imagine how this worked for me. Okay, so I had, I was, yeah, this was something that I was growing up on my entire life, trying to figure this out. According to the elements of the world, 
this is the lower system of authority. Does the world have authority? Yes, it has a certain realm of authority to it, but this is the lower realm, lower realm of authority. If the higher realm of authority contradicts that lower realm of authority, then I don't have to do the lower realm of authority. Okay, higher authority rules. This is very good. According to the elements of the world and not according to Christ. Christ elevates everything. Okay, now he's saying... Don't get caught up in all this philosophy, all these traditions, all these things that are not Christ. Now, I think it's interesting. He does not use the name of Jesus. He uses the title of the position of Jesus called the Anointed One that is going to make the effect happen. And he says, what is it? The Mystery is the anointed one in you, the hope of glory. He comes here and he says, and not according to Christ. He keeps using this title, Christ, okay? Christ is not a last name. Christ is a title of a person, the Messiah, the Christ, the only one who can be. And there he is. Now, can you pray in the name of Christ? Yeah, that's Jesus. That's the name of the Christ. Let's go on to verse 9. It says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is the Christ. This is the second of the Godhead, the Son. And yet in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bodily. This has been a a passage of absolute wonder for me for as long as I can remember. Nobody has been able to explain this to me. I don't know if I'm going to do much better in explaining it to you, okay? But we're going to give it a shot. Kato Ikeo. Kata, meaning? Down. What a woman. Isn't she amazing? Oikeo. To live, to dwell. Katokeo, to dwell permanently. <laughs> to settle in, be done. There's a, there it is. For in him dwells the total full to the extreme. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Theotes, Godhead. How do you, do, how do you, how do you translate this word? all of the authority of divinity, all the capturing of godness. Godness is not a word. Um, how do you... Everything that is God is wrapped up in this one word, the theotes, the godness, the godhead. Okay. Go ahead and let your minds just kind of try to wrap around Everything the Father is, everything the Son is, and everything the Holy Spirit is, is called the Godhead. And all of that dwells permanently inside Jesus Christ bodily. Somaticos of the body. Go ahead, just, just, just go ahead and wrap your intellect around that and see how far it goes. Here's Jesus Christ. And in him is everything the Father is, everything the Son is, everything the Holy Spirit is, is in him. And he has decided to inhabit a body. Okay, now you see my little problem here? I'm trying to explain this. The fullness of the deity, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling inside a person and I always go back to that, that psalm that says, and a body was prepared for me. Can you imagine the Father creating this first body inside Mary? Boom. And it started to grow, and he knits it together in Mary's womb. And he's building it cell by cell, sinew upon sinew, making the bones, making the organs, making the, the blood, making everything flowing inside this body. And inside this body dwells the fullness of the Godhead. And then you wonder, he was born, and the angels start freaking out. And what are they saying? 
the manifestation of God of all that is the spirit realm is being manifested into the physical realm. And what do we call that? That term is called glory. And they're singing glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. It's bringing it all together in one shot. And there's the package. (laughs) So how does that work? I don't know. I've tried to wrap my mind around this aspect Okay, now you're all thinking that this is the big nugget on the day. Until I said that, you were thinking that, hey, hey, but well, wait until verse 10 that says, huh, yeah. Whew, here we go, here we go, wind it up. Here it goes. And having been filled, you are in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Now, since you're so cocky about it, come here and stand right here. As deep as theology as we're getting, and you walk up, and the thing you have to say is, I like these shoes. Look them in the eye. (laughs) Jesus Christ, in whom is the entire Godhead living bodily, has decided that if somebody comes to him, he is going to dwell in them. So in this little frame up here, this scrawny little, I don't know how those wrists actually get anything going, tiny little scrawny things, I don't know. In this body up here with this nose, this body, inside this body, dwells the Jesus who inside his body dwells the fullness of the deity. Go ahead and explain this to me. And yet, in this person is the ability to say no to God and do what she wants to do. Think about this. Who are you? Who are you? Now, why haven't we seen this manifest in a better way? You may sit down. The indwelling of him who is all in all. Now, this is, this is one of those little things that's really kind of almost impossible to translate perfectly in English because it has a portion of grammar that we don't have. Okay? It usually looks like it's heading for the future, okay? And having been filled, you are in him. Okay, it looks like it, it shows that there's something that is a process that is being done that has to be accomplished, but it hasn't been necessarily accomplished yet, and we're kind of looking for the future, but it, it's not really future tense in saying it will happen at some point. Okay, this is a, a, not a progressive thing, but it's something, that's sit, it's sitting there in limbo waiting for this thing to happen. It's progressive in the fact that it's... It's not using the grammar that says that something has started in the past and is continuing. It's something that is, has no time frame to it. It's aorist. So it's not about past, but it's about something that God has put in position that is in the process of being done that will be fulfilled in the future. It's kind of hard to describe. Okay. <laughs> Even though I'm trying my hardest here. Okay. This is in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, if you go back on the table back there, you're going to find a piece of paper that has Ephesians chapter 1, 17 through 19 on it. Where does this start? Verse 20. So this is right after that prayer. So let's think about that prayer for just a second before we go any further. And it says, we pray that you may be given a spirit of wisdom and and revelation in the revelation knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened for you to know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing surpassing power of his great power towards us who believe. Now that is setting us all up, okay? This awesome prayer of setting us up here. And then it says, which? He worked in who? 
Christ, the anointed one, in raising him from the dead, yea, he seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies, far above all rule and authority and power and lordship and every name having been named, not only in this age but also in the coming age. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, the assembly, which is his body, colon, description of his body, the fullness of the one filling all things in all. Breaker just tripped again. Okay, meaning what? This is the body. The fullness of the deity in Jesus Christ in bodily form and he has been put in us to where we are the fullness of the filling of everything. We're the body of Christ for the body of the anointed one. How anointed are you? More than you know. More than at this point you can know. So what has God called you to do? You say, well, I don't think I can do it. No, wait a minute. He's anointed you to do it. It has nothing to do with whether you can or cannot, whether you want to or don't want to. What is the big issue? The big issue is he has already put within you everything you will ever need to get done what he has called you to do. Where are you going to go to get more power? You can't. He's already given it. Okay, what's the issue? The issue is you're not living what you know you are. You're not even living what you know about now, let alone what we are trying to explain to you what you already have. This is heavy. How full is our fullness? How full is our fullness? Guys, I'm just trying to give you an idea of what's beyond. I don't even know. How are we going to practically apply this today? This is going to be really a trick. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, there's another prayer back there on the table from Ephesians chapter 3. That says, this also I pray, <laughs> here, watch this, that you may be given strength to grasp with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Anybody remember this passage? Yeah. <laughs> and to know the surpassing knowledge and the love of Christ, that, all of that, that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. What should we be praying for each other? That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What would happen to anyone in this room if they really got revelation of the fullness of God that he is doing in them? This is like the Ephesians 1 passage. This is the end of a prayer. This is praying that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. All the knowledge, understanding, wisdom, and revelation that God has. Practical application of all of it. Okay? Now you can see where we're going with this. Where we're going is that we are not experiencing what he has already given. We are not fully experiencing and living what he has already given us. What were the, 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 the most phenomenal words on the cross that Jesus said was, it is finished. He doesn't have to do anymore. He is the fullness. He purchased it all to give it to us. And what did we get? We get the fullness. Filled to the fullness of God. Oh, yeah, there's a simple little statement. You may be filled to all the fullness of God. Still in Ephesians, chapter 4. What verse? What's verse 11? It says, but God gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Understand, God has given the anointing of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher to men to do something with on this planet. And he gave the anointing of these five anointings into the planet. And it says, verse 12, with a view to the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry, actually into the work of the ministry, into the building up of the body of Christ, until we all may come into the unity of the faith and into the full knowledge of the Son of God, 
into a full-grown man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Until we all have the same revelation knowledge and we all have the same faith, we're not done. Until he grows us up. Until what? Until the body itself becomes mature enough unto what measure? Until the full measure of the fullness of Christ. We're not done until we match his maturity level. We aren't done until we reach this. Until the body of Christ has been built up. Fullness has been given for us to get fullness. The fullness has been given for us to get. You see, right now, just think of all the little excuses that you've been given on how come you're not walking the Christian walk that you should be. How good are those excuses? Not. Okay, see, this is what's getting me. Okay, we're going to be taking this message, if everything is playing out the way it's playing out right now, we will sell this property, move it probably. We don't know that for sure. What's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. It doesn't matter. Because all that is the fullness of the deity in Nathaniel is being brought to the point where he will be able to go to wherever it is he goes, whether it's to our new church, to another church, to something else, it doesn't really matter. What's the message that God is trying to bring to us is that we need to be prepared to be everything to go out into these other places and touch other people and be in other churches and do whatever. It isn't about us sitting here in all of our conspiracy theory to just sit here and just wait until everything falls apart to be, so we can become awesome. No, no, no. The awesomeness is going to happen when you are manifesting all that God is out there in a place where these people don't have a clue what's coming. And so what are we going to do? <laughs> I'm going to be really mean about it. I'm going to send <laughs> Nathaniel into a place and he'll go into this place and he's going to blow up in the fullness of God and they're all going to go, ah. Why? Because until we get that message out there, we can't expect the body of Christ to come into the fullness. Until those who are willing to walk in the fullness are going to go out there and lead people into the fullness that they're supposed to be. Am I making sense? Christ's likeness is the goal. Am I done with Ephesians? Yeah, I am. All right, here we go. Back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. <laughs> if that wasn't enough, I don't know what to tell you. And having been filled, you are in him who is the head of all rule and authority. The indwelling of him who is all in all, filled with the fullness. Wow, who are you? Awesomeness. You are phenomenal. You are more than you know greater than you know, better than you know, more holy than you know, more righteous than you know. You have the fingerprints of God on your very being. Then the question comes, why aren't we seeing more? Having been filled, you are in him who's the head of all rule and authority. Here we are, we're bringing it up again. Authority. It's all about the authority. How much should we submit? The reason we're not seeing the fullness is because we're not fully submitted. The issue is submission. Always has been submission, always will be submission. And it is that, that Christian cuss word that people don't like to talk about, submission. To whereas we are not the God we are obeying, but we are actually submitted to the God who is talking to us, and we are obeying him. How do we get all this? Ah, by obedience. It's by obedience. How can God call you to be the fullness if you're not going to be obedient to what he tells you to do? See, for us to send Nathaniel out into a, a, a Bible study somewhere and let him blow up, he's going to have to not be Nathaniel when he goes into the Bible study. He's going to have to be Christ in him, the fullness, when he walks in. He's going to have to walk in in obedience and not have 
to deal with his own trust issues. He's going to have to have that dealt with before he walks in the door. We getting the idea? How much do we resist? Wow, way, way too much. So do we want religion? Uh, I don't think so, no. A real person lives in us. A real person. This morning as we were praying for Sister Eugenia here, the Lord had a word for her, okay, that I, I heard this. That the mysteries she's been dealing with are going to be answered. And then the Lord's going to say, I'm going to just replace it with more mysteries. <laughs> I had to giggle. I said, you're doing that to me too, aren't you? He, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, every piece of revelation you have just means I just you put that one, you set it, and you're, hey, I got this one, and that hole fills, that hole is there. And God goes, here's another mystery you never thought about. And, oh, God. Mm. So last night at the dinner table, we had this wonderful little discussion that thrilled me to pieces, and yet I, I just hardly didn't say a thing. In fact, is though we talked about flying. I, uh, I was out in the little, I was, I heard something. If you've never been up where you're just totally quiet, do you ever hear, hear a crow fly without him cawing or anything? They squeak. Their wings actually do a squeaking sound as they come in. Whoa. This just goes through. It's just kind of fascinating. So I was walking from the house to the church when I heard a lot of squeaking all of a sudden. Like this, and I turned around like this, and two crows were playing Star Wars with each other, okay? And they hit right here. They missed me by an inch. Just, and I heard this, and felt the, the air go, these two birds went right by me. And I went, whoa! And I turned around, and these guys were chasing each other, and they're going around the flagpole. That that was fun. One went around the other, chased them around the flagpole. They were up and down, almost hitting the ground. They almost ran into the redemption building. They're, just, they're all ranging all over the parade ground over here. Everything. And I'm just watching these two flying, and I'm just thrilled. And I went, oh, I want to do that. Oh, God, that'd be so fun. What are we going to be able to do with a glorified body? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but we are going to explore the limits. <laughs> huh, aren't we, huh, yeah, okay. Are we going to be able to fly? And, and so Roxanne was talking about a dream she's had about flying. And Jared was talking about his, how oh, he just, that's it. It's all the further off the ground he can get. It's, it's been a frustrating dream for Jared because he can only get this far off the ground. He's trying so hard to get, just, that's it. <laughs> Flight, why not? Here's the issue. Here's the issue. It has nothing to do with flying. It has to do with the principles involved in how this whole thing works. Until we understand the epiphysics of the spirit realm applied to the physics of the physical realm, which is so far above and beyond. Jesus poofed in and out, phased in and out, was gone. He translated himself to wherever he wanted to go. He changed shape. He was a different person. Then all of a sudden they recognized him when he broke bread. I mean, he did all these amazing... He ate. It's a good thing. For those of us who like to eat, we're still going to be able to eat. It's all good. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Jesus did anything he wanted to. How? He was no longer confined to the strains of the physical because as long as he was on the earth before the crucifixion, he was to a degree confined to the physical but after the resurrection, no confines. He did whatever he wanted. Are you kidding me? This is amazing. But he couldn't do anything he wanted without the Father because in him dwelled the fullness. He did it all the Father's way. Did they, do they have fun? Yes. You got to know that was fun. Okay? 
That was fun to break bread and then recognize him as Jesus and all of a sudden he just disappear. Now that was classic. How do we get there? Ah, there's the question. Because the Bible says when God gives the Spirit, he gives it without measure. How much of the Holy Spirit did you get? All. Therefore, how much power do you have? All. How come you can't use it all? Because the all is not submitted. The more we are submitted, the more we will be able to be used of the Holy Spirit to do what he calls us to do. Now, this is the end times. Everybody I've ever known at this point tells us that. I don't know anybody that's denying that we are coming to the very, very end of things. If you'll look at the history of the church and the progressive revelation as Jesus was giving more and more revelation of Christ in them, they were doing more, getting more things done. You can just see this, this thing has been growing and growing and growing. What's it going to be like at the very end when the certain portion of the body of Christ will have Christ formed in them? Remember? Yes. Who formed in them? Jesus? Jesus. Christ formed the anointed one formed in them for the anointing to happen awesome but they will have no hindrances they will have gotten rid of the hindrances that's keeping that from happening that's what god is calling us to do we need to understand the fullness we need to, to know more about what he is trying to get through us we need to understand authority and we need to submit to it Submission is your friend, not your enemy. We must be filling ourselves with the Spirit. Remember? Do you remember what we've been talking about? Filling ourselves with the Spirit. This is a joy, not a burden. Oh, I've got to do this. No, no, we get to do this. Okay? This is awesome. We need to do beyond what we understand. But what do we understand? More than we're doing. Okay? We know more than we understand, but we understand more than we're doing. Okay? By choice, we can sin and do what? Cause death. That's the big issue. Where's the heart? The connection between the spirit and the soul. The attributes of God have been given to us to be who he's called us to be, and the things the spirit are supposed to make it into our soul from our spirit and change us. Now, where have we the total fullness? We have the total fullness in our spirit where the Holy Spirit dwells, where Jesus dwells in our hearts, where the Father is dwelling in us because we have the fullness of the Godhead in us in bodily form. It's in us. Your body is housing all of that. And again, I still cannot explain all that. I, I, I've been trying for a long time. I want to be able to get to understand the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of all this, this is the fullness. He's trying to get that down into us. But we also know that through wounds and choices and false identities, we have an issue called the hardness of heart, and the things of the Spirit can't make it into my soul, which means what? Exactly what Miranda said, the hardness of heart is causing the problem of us not gaining the fullness. And... I can't see who I really am. Why? Because our problems of being in the hardness of heart is there because of our selfishness. And it's about us focusing on us, which is what that's all about. Why don't we walk in obedience? That's why. Now, we know that the defilement of the body is there, and everywhere where there's hardness of heart is also defiled. The defilement is everywhere where that hardness of heart is. And that doesn't look very good, does it? That looks pretty packed. Well, that's just because we're looking at just the negative. If I can walk, bring healing, forgiveness, repentance, and get rid of some of the hardness of heart, if I can get rid of the hardness of heart, what happens? It softens and opens the heart, and in that area, I am now being filled. I am being filled and being filled. Now, the beautiful thing is that's the fruit of the Spirit, of him walking through my spirit into my soul, out my soul, and touching other people, which is another thing of calling it 
the anointing. But the thing that we don't, that I really had to get everybody to see is all this white. Wait a minute. That's areas where there is no hardness of heart. So what's it really look like? Ah, look how much we are being filled of the Holy Spirit. This is what fullness is all about, is getting rid of these hardness of heart things so that we can be filled. And the more we get rid of these stupid, crummy things, the more we have a chance to find the fullness of God in our soul, which makes us what? Much more susceptible of the things of the Spirit going through us and actually even affecting our bodies. You see how deep this is? What is God calling you to? And then we can worship him. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. What's worship going to be like when we're experiencing the fullness? Let's read this whole passage again. It's only three verses. Piece of cake, right? Watch there not be one robbing you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the elements of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And having been filled, you are in him who is the head of all rule and authority. What a passage. What a tight little three verses. You carry all the fullness. So what are you willing to submit? What are you willing to say? What's the Holy Spirit convicting you of that you're hanging on to so tightly that all you have to do is get rid of it, and what happens? Another area of your life gains the fullness, gains who He is in you. You get to become more of who you are. So the question is, how well do you know Him? <laughs> and what of Him can you give to others? Well, can't give what you don't have so what's the issue Christ likeness to get the anointing in us to change so we can have the anointing to help others follow why is God doing this to us right now I want everybody in this whole congregation to get the idea of God's calling that he is calling us to a higher purpose, a higher understanding, a higher than we've ever seen before. We're thinking we're at the height, we're at the zenith, we're at the apex, not hardly. We may be at the zenith of our experience so far, but we're not at the zenith of our potential. Jared had a football coach. Yes, Jared actually played football. Yeah. We all said the same thing. Really, Jared? But he had a football coach that said, I would rather have a kid. He told us about this with Jared, because Jared had heart. He wasn't the best football player out there. But he did have heart. He went out and worked. He said, I would rather have kids with heart than kids with potential. He says, because unrealized potential is just so much horse stuff. And that's truth. Unrealized potential means you're what? You're not walking up to who you are potentially able to be. What is your potential? Your potential is to be Christ-like, to be full, to have the fullness. That's your potential. Are we living up to our potential? We've got so much. Now, I was praying this, and they all heard me praying this. I was praying over here this morning, is that this is not to be a condemnation. That's not what this is about, is getting us to be, oh, I'm just so bad. Stop it! Just stop it! That's not about condemning ourselves. It's about knowing where we are and going on. Are you bad? Oh, yeah. So, let's go on. Let's get rid of the hardness of heart that makes that stuff happen so we can have the fullness God's calling us to. Amen? Now, we're going to pray and break. If you're smart, you wouldn't let us calling the kids in and having a little bit of fellowship time to break up what the Holy Spirit is doing in this room right now. Because when Miranda gets up there and she starts working on worship time, 
what is this? This is a time where we have set aside for us to be able to be alone with Jesus, for him to work on us what things he needs to deal with us about. If that means you're convicted about something and you know needs to be given to Jesus, give it to him. Do you have to come forward to do it? If that's what it's going to take, then get forward. If it means kneeling up here to where you're in serious business with Jesus, get up here and do that thing. If it means laying out before him, then lay out before him. If it means crying out, cry out. Whatever it's going to take to bring us closer to who he is. If you have to go outside and walk around in the sunlight a little bit and breathe, that's cool. Do whatever it takes, but you get yourself closer to Jesus today. That's our practical application for the day. This heavy-duty, deep theology is a call of God to show us where we can be. Don't, don't mistake it. And don't cheese out on it. All right? It's too cool. It's very important that you do what God is calling you to do today. All right? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for what you're doing for us. Lord, you are magnificent. You are amazing. And Lord, we are continually giving you praise. Lord, you are so good. Lord, we've touched a, a glimpse of the Almighty, a glimpse of the fullness of God. Just touched it. Lord, call us deeper. Call us, bring us, show us what is hindering that we might become who you've called us to be and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.